All right, second up, we're going to be talking about the Tavistock case. Now, this is a British High Court decision that is changing the conversation on gender dysphoria and the treatment of transgenderism in young people. It's called Tavistock versus, for the Americans, versus Bell. For the English and Australians, Tavistock and Bell. There's a different way of saying it. Uh, it's a High Court case out of the UK, etc. And it was actually handed down in December, but it's a big enough deal that I knew that I had to return to it at some point and deal with it in detail and explain to you what it's all about. What is Tavistock? It's a gender clinic, officially a gender identity development service. It's for children under the age of 18. The clinic administers puberty blockers to children as young as 10. It prescribes cross-sex hormones to children as young as 16. And it progresses with gender reassignment surgeries for adolescents from the, or for um, young people from the age of 18. An important point is this. Children are required to consent to their own therapies under the Tavistock principles and the way that it works and the way that these clinics work in general. The question before the court therefore was, can children even consent to those therapies? Do they have the capacity? Good question. Now, who is Belle? Remember, it's Tavistock and Belle. Who's Belle? Well, that's Kira Belle. She's a 23-year-old woman who was treated by the clinic on her pathway to becoming a trans man. Ms. Belle has now detransitioned, and uh, there's ongoing permanent effects of, what, of, of that, So, but nonetheless, she's detransitioned to the extent that she can, uh, and she sued the clinic for what it did to her, saying that she was not able to consent to the treatments that it provided, and indeed, no child is able to, and she wanted the court to make that finding, that a child cannot consent to these treatments, which are life-altering in ways that a child will never understand. And I think that's just on the face of it, fair enough because these are kids who cannot drive, who cannot drink, who cannot smoke. Some of them can't choose their own bedtime. They can't get a tattoo. They can't vote. But apparently they can decide whether they're a man or a woman and make irreversible actions to confirm it through medical treatments. That's my opinion. What did the High Court say? They had a lot of concerns actually that fed into their final conclusion. I want to list a few of those concerns. The first range of concerns, which is really worrying, was regarding to the practices of the clinic itself. They said the clinic did not keep records sufficient, uh, and I read the decision, they were quite skeptical of the clinic's practices in this regard, and indeed it looks like they were right. First of all, the clinic could not produce records of the ages of their patients, despite how young they are, and the experimental nature of the treatment and its profound impact. I mean, these kids are under 10, a lot of them. Uh, secondly, uh, the, the, re the clinic did not keep records of how many of the children who came to it had autism. And that's a big issue because many of these children have autism and the question is, well, hang on, is it the autism that's the issue or the gender dysphoria that's the issue? But they couldn't tell the court how many had autism, even though many do. Thirdly, there was no information provided by the clinic about how many young people with gender dysphoria were not prescribed puberty blockers. Now, remember, the child has to consent to its own treatment. And so you would think there'd be many who couldn't. Well, the court said, well, how many? The clinic couldn't tell them. Uh, and the court said it was left with a strong impression that this rarely, if ever, happened, which is really concerning. Uh, a child feels gender dysphoric, bang, straight on the puberty blockers, straight down the pathway of treatment for you. Finally, the clinic could not say what proportion of young people who were prescribed puberty blockers progressed across sex hormones. Uh, and in each of these cases, the, court's quite, the court seems to suggest that they either could not or would not uh, which is even more concerning. Would not means they've got something to hide. And it's interesting, the court, that comes through from reading it. They said, well, they wouldn't supply the information. Uh, whether they could, probably not, maybe, don't know. Uh, but they wouldn't provide information on how many of these kids on puberty blockers progressed to cross-sex hormone treatment. And again, the court said that almost all of them do so. That was the impression that it got. Okay, those are concerns about information, but they were also concerned about the information that they did have. And here's some of it. Between July 2019 and June 2020, so roughly a 12-month period, 161 children were referred to the clinic for puberty blockers. 26 of those children were under 13 years of age, and well over 50% of them were under 16 years of age. And in 2009, they also commented on now the increase in referrals overall to the clinic. So in 2009, 97 children were referred to the clinic. Fast forward to 2018, you have 2,519 children referred to the clinic. Now, these increases are similar in Australia, and they directly correlate with the rise and rise and rise of gender curriculum, you know, gender fluid, non-binary concepts being taught in schools. I mean, who would have thought that you put the idea into a child's head and they might actually get the idea and think that it's a good one, or start thinking about it, or start obsessing over it in the case of the autistic situations? Well, surprise, it directly correlates thousands of percent increases in children who are 
going for uh, treatments for gender dysphoria. It's very sad. There's a surge in female referrals. The court noted that in 2011 it was a 50-50 gender split between ma males and females in patients. By 2019, so not that many years, was that eight years or something? 76%, more than three quarters of patients were female. That is also a global trend and there's specific reasons why young girls might be more vulnerable to these sorts of narratives. Again, it's very, very sad. More broadly, however, referring to the evidence for pu puberty blocker treatment in general, the court said the following. The court said puberty blockers cause a person to miss a period of normal adolescent development which can never be recovered or reversed. Now, that's important. Can never be recovered or reversed. They miss a period of normal adolescent development. They said that puberty blockers almost always result in a person progressing to cross-sex hormones, which are, quote, to a very significant degree not reversible. Okay, so that pretty much is the guaranteed pathway, except in rare cases. They said they agreed that there is no firm evidence to demonstrate the efficacy of puberty blockers, nor to properly understand their short and long-term consequences. They made the point there's barely any literature to help understand what are the consequences of these, these, these treat, this treatment long-term. It's very hard to say. They also agreed that puberty blockers cause gender dysphoria to persist, or they suggested it was a strong possibility, because of the evidence that if you don't use puberty blockers, the issue resolves itself in the vast majority of young people. And in this way, they speculated that puberty blockers may be confirming gender dysphoria by ensuring that that young person does not experience adolescence. That is also concerning. They said that the consequences of the treatment are, quote, highly complex and potentially lifelong and life-changing in the most fundamental way imaginable. Now, they also made the point that gender dysphoria is not a physically manifesting um, condition. It's psychological. And yet the treatments have uh, biological and physiological consequences, which did, doesn't seem to make sense. Look, I say all that. This is what the High Court of the United Kingdom is saying. I say all that because we need to really come face to face with how serious this matter is. Um, and the court was therefore well and truly doubting whether a child can consent to puberty blocker treatment. And specific factors they mentioned they were concerned over were one, the fact that the consequences are not even fully understood by adults. So how could they be fully understood by the child who's receiving the treatment? Secondly, there is a clear connection between puberty blockers, then cross-sex hormones, then surgery. Thirdly, uh, the loss of fertility issue is something that a child couldn't possibly understand the implications of, and also the impact on sexual function, the same. And I made this point that understanding the basic concepts is not the same as understanding how they will affect your adult life when you are a child. That level of understanding, they were skeptical whether a child could ever achieve it. And they concluded that for a young person under 16, there would be enormous difficulties understanding and weighing the implications of puberty blocker treatment. For children between 14 and 15, they said it was doubtful they could consent. For children under 13, they said it was, they said it was highly unlikely. Uh, now, in the world of legal speak, you don't tend to get stronger than that, um, so that's pretty strong. Um, but of course, in different legal contexts, it, those words can still, there's a little bit of wiggle room in them, but they're pretty strong in the legal universe. Um, and this case represents the first major pushback by a superior court in the United Kingdom or Australia, or perhaps in the whole Anglosphere world, um, in, a, in pulling apart the practices of the uh, of, of, of gender dysphoria, the treatment of gender dysphoria and the practices of these gender clinics which are on the rise and rise across the Western world. Now, frankly, none of this surprises me. And the truth is it's not just because of the activists in the schools. The activists are simply reaping a harvest from very, very ripe fields because they are answering questions to which children have no alternative answers. In other words, what is a man, what is a woman? No one has the guts to answer the question except the gender-bending activists going into your child's school or writing books for the book club or writing scripts for Disney and all this kind of stuff. So I'm gonna give some of those answers in the next segment. But meanwhile, that was the truth about the Tavistock case which is finally starting to change the conversation around the treatment of gender dysphoria in young people. We have a long way to go 
but hey, small beginnings, let's rejoice over that. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe by hitting the icons below and make sure you hit the gray bell as well so you get notified when there's a new video. And if you want to watch more, you can click on the links right about here. Thank you.